Okay, so let's uh, finish this class with uh, the last theorem of, uh, of the semester. So I mentioned it last week, right? I think I, uh, and I even mentioned the infrared bound. And I explained how one was, in, I mean, this general thing. So we had this theorem saying if the infimum of the sigma 0, sigma x for the free at beta, the infimum on x is 0, then then we have that. And I told you that for the nearest neighbor ferromagnetic model on ZD, we had the infrared bound, which was implying that sigma 0, sigma x, beta 3, was smaller than a certain constant, which was something like 2 over beta times the green function. In particular, this was tending to zero when x tends to infinity. And this was, of course, for any beta smaller or equal to beta c. If you take for beta larger, you need to truncate. That's an important feature. OK, so in particular, it tells you, I mean, just notice then the magnetization at beta c is equal to, of course, sigma 0 plus at beta c, but if it's equal to sigma 0 free at beta c, then it must be 0. Okay? So it really implies continuity in the standard sense. OK. Um, also observe that in 2D, another remark is that in 2D, we have uh, that uh, we know by Zhang, Zhang's argument implies exactly our assumption as well. So the fact that sigma 0, sigma x, 3 at beta c tends to 0 when x tends to infinity. Because this is the probability of connectivity for the free state. And this, we know that for the random cluster model at criticality with free running condition on Z2, there is no infinite cluster. OK, so you can do it on every ZD. Actually, you have a simple proof of, uh, of, uh, of continuity on ZD, on Z2. But I, will, I really want to, um, to highlight the fact that it's still unknown whether, for instance, so as an open question, even though it starts to be close to, uh, to be solved, but take, say, Z2 times 0k. So you take a slab. Is the magnetization at beta c equal to 0 in this case? So it's not Z2, it's not Zd. You see, the problem is that this graph is not transient for the uh, simple random work. So you cannot use the techniques that I, uh, that I, uh, I mean, you cannot use the infrared bound. At the same time, it's not planar, even though it's roughly planar somehow. It's coarse, I mean, it's roughly isometric to a planar graph, but it's not planar. And so in particular, you, the techniques like Zhang argument or things like that do not work there. So this is, uh, I mean, it's, tractable question probably, but it's not direct uh, application of the theory. Okay, so we want to prove this thing. How do we do that? So the idea is going to be to look at the geometric properties of a certain current. So before we introduce uh, the sum of two sourceless currents, we are going to do the same, except that one of the current is going to be for the free boundary conditions and one for the plus boundary condition. So take a graph G on G. Consider, um, so let's call it P beta free on G. 
is uh, low on currents n, which is equal to, I mean, which is proportional to omega beta of n if there are no sources, and 0 otherwise. So if there is no sources, the n, n is in omega g. Remember, meaning the, the currents on g. And we are going to take also p plus g beta of n. It's going to be the same thing, except that this time n is on g union the Gauss vertex delta. So one is, they are both on sourceless currents, except that one is for the plus, one is for the free boundary condition. And let's define P, B, G beta, to be the law of, uh, the law of N1 plus N2 hat uh, restri and N2, I'm going to say, okay, here, a priori, this is a law on G union uh, delta. I'm going to restrict it to G. So I'm going to just say um, um, here. Well, and then, then, then this, then this I, I look at. So let's say this is P tilde. And then I look at this guy, which is the law restricted to uh, which is just the low p theta plus g beta restricted to g. I'm not interested in, in the edges between the vertices of g and delta. The law of n1 plus n where n1 is simple according to p g beta free, n2 is simple according to p g beta plus, and n1 is independent of n2. Okay, so this is, we, we did that several times. By the way, I'm going to just stick to the nearest neighbor. The proof works very well for, uh, for uh, infinite range. There is really no problem there, but maybe for the notation, I don't want to have the J, X, Y everywhere. So let's, uh, let's stick to nearest neighbor. Okay, so we have a law on G, and this is a percolation law, right? I looked at the trace of N1 plus N2. So this is a percolation model. The question, the natural question you want to, uh, to ask first is what is happening when G tends to ZD? And so first theorem is going to be the following. It's going to be that um, P G beta converges weakly to a certain low P beta where P beta is a law on 0, 1 to the ZD, to the edges of ZD. Furthermore, well, furthermore, P beta satisfies, so P beta is invariant under translation. And second thing, T beta is ergodic. Remember, that means that any event which is invariant under translation has, low, uh, has probability 0 or 1. So I'm not going to prove this thing because it's not super interesting. But let me just tell you quickly why. I mean, why it's not surprising at all that this occurs. So the first thing you observe is that, I mean, in fact, you could also take the law just without the trace. And then looking at the law without the trace or looking at just, uh, where, I mean, just keeping track of whether it's odd or even is sufficient. Because if I give you that these edges are odd, these edges are even, I mean, even positive or even zero, 
then uh, you can reconstruct by just saying, okay, if I know it's even, then I know the conditionally on the fact that it's even. It's just independent to know, uh, it's a certain random variable to know that the value of the edge itself. So my point is that you only need, only need to look at the measure on somehow zero odd even to the edges of G. That's the, on, the only uh, information you need. Yes. Even odd and even is odd and even is sufficient. Uh, and it's even positive. So. Sorry. Odd and even is not uh, sufficient. So you say the odd and the the odd and even uh, converge and then condition on odd and even could be constructed. Yes. Exactly. Zero is. No, we we are going to want zero. It's going to be useful to have zero. And then what you can see uh, fairly easily is um, you can look at, actually maybe this is not even, I mean this, okay, let's maybe ignore just that. Let's just look at, let's look at simple. Look at the probability that the set A of edges a, uh, I mean, n e equals zero for any edge e in A. Let's look at this like that. That's that's maybe better. And this thing, so you can look at what uh, at what it is, and it can it can be expressed. It's it's a big formula, but it can be expressed in terms of correlation functions, so sigma x, sigma y, in here, in subset b, in, in, in g minus a certain set of edges b. So if you look at this family of guys with x, y in g and b subset of the edges in g, and you look at this quantity, well, you just express what it is. It's a ratio of partition functions and things like that. And you are going to exactly see that it's expressed in terms of this type of quantities. Actually, maybe you want even to simplify our thing. You could even say this. Now, the point, and here it's free or plus. So you have a big product of these quantities. This is a probability that any is equal to 0 for every edge in A. But the product of all these quantities, I mean, all these quantities, when g tends to zd, they converge. So all these quantities, so let's call this big set C, all quantities Cg, all quantities in Cg converge to their corresponding quantity which is going to be of the form sigma c to the zd minus p. So you just do a big f thing, you are going to get that it's, it's expressed like that. So in particular, that means that this quantity converges for every set A. Okay? But the fact of being closed for a certain uh, set A, if, I mean, if you, this spans the sigma algebra. So the convergence of this implies the convergence of everybody. That's the idea. It's a little bit tricky, a little bit dirty work, but it's really simple. Then for the translational, in, uh, I mean, the invariance under translation, well, just look there. If you take G or a translate of G, you are going to converge to the same thing at the end. So in fact, you are, these quantities are going to converge to the same quantity at the end. So this will give you translational invariance. Then for the ergodicity, you need to be a little bit more uh, careful. And you need basically to use the same type of idea that you were using for uh, the random cluster model. So in fact, when you are going to look at the ergodicity, you are going to look at a set A, which is depending on finitely many edges. Another, I mean, and then 
when you say probability of the intersection of A with itself, you translate one of the A very far, and you prove that they are roughly independent. How do you prove that they are roughly independent? Well, you are going to be able to express if you say A union B here, I mean A union the translate of A, all of these things are going to be expressed in, quanti in quantities where you are going to get G minus A union translate of A. And for the free and the plus state, because they come from the random cluster model, which is ergodic and mixing, when you look at guys farther and farther away, the probability of the intersection is roughly the product of the probabilities, you are going to be able to use that to say that these guys are going to factorize, basically. When you get G minus A minus a translate of A, these guys, you are going to manage to write them as product of something G minus A times product of something G minus translate of A. And this, this is going to also allow you to do the ergodicity. So, I mean, the definition is not complicated. The invariance of the translation is not complicated. The ergodicity is not complicated either, but it's really dirtier and dirtier when you try to do it. But the important thing is really everything comes somehow all this convergence and everything, it comes from uh, phi 0 g p 2 converge to phi 0 p 2 and the same thing with 1. It's really an ergodicity of these guys. All these properties of the random current, they come from, from these properties for the random cluster models. And this we proved that the, the random cluster model, the free and the wired conditions were ergodic and uh, invariant of the translations. Okay, so this is going to be a little bit my black box. I don't really want to do to prove it because it's rather technical and the result is not so surprising. It's, it's what you expect. Now, what do we do with that? Well, Let's try to prove that there is no infinite cluster in this measure. So how could we try to prove that there is no infinite measure in uh, infinite cluster in this measure at beta? Well, the first thing we could look at, we could say, OK, let x and y be two vertices. And let's look at the probability on the beta that x is connected to y. Okay? So this is, by definition, the limit when g tends to zd of the probability of g beta of x connected to y. And now a question. What is this thing in our context? What is the probability? How can I express the probability that x is connected to y? Well, I use a switching lemma. So switching lemma. So this thing is still like that. If I use a switching lemma here, I got, let's, let's write it with, uh, we had empty, empty G, G union delta of x connected to y in N1 plus N2 divided by z of g, g union and delta of empty set, empty set. That was our original thing. So the switching lemma is allowing us to say, OK, we get rid of that. And that just changed that here I get sources x and y and x and y. So here, it's not exactly the switching lemma. Why? Because here I don't have the same graph. I have G and I have a bigger graph G. But notice that here it's not X is connected to Y, it's X is connected to Y in G. Right? Because I only look at the trace in G. Well, it's good for us because this is exactly the switching lemma. So if you take G and H with H larger than G, and you do the switching lemma, you are going to get exactly the connectivity properties in G. You can run the same proof. It's exactly the same proof. There is not a, not a single difference. The, it just when you do it carefully, you, you get x related to y in g. So it's just a switching lemma. 
And now when I look at this, now when I have this ratio, I get, I get what? Here, now, I mean, since there is not a single thing like that, the n1 and n2, they decouple, and I get just sigma x sigma y in G with free boundary condition, and sigma x sigma y in G with plus boundary condition because I'm looking at the current like that. So this has a limit, and the limit is sigma x sigma y free at beta, sigma x sigma y plus at beta. So the correlations are controlled by the spin-spin correlations of the easing model. And the nice observation here is that you get this inequality. So by definition, we did use that the infimum when x tends to infinity of p beta 0x is 0. So that looks very good to deduce that there is a unique infinite, uh, that there is an, uh, no infinite cluster at beta. What is the only thing I need to check? Is I need to check that, well, I mean, this is not the probability that zero is connected to infinity. Imagine you have infinitely many clusters, then the probability that zero is connected to infinity may be, uh, I mean, the probability that zero is connected to x may be zero without, I mean, maybe tending to zero without having probability that zero connected to infinity equals zero. Okay? So this doesn't imply directly the fact that zero and, uh, I mean, that zero is connected to infinity with probability zero. Okay? How would you prove it in general? What you would prove is you would do the following. You would use the, I mean, say the FKG inequality to say probability that zero connected to x is larger than probability that zero, I mean, it's larger than probability that zero connected to infinity and x connected to infinity. And then you would say, okay, it's larger than the product. The only problem here is that when you say, I mean, zero connected to infinity and x connected to infinity, in order to tell you that this means that zero and x are uh, connected together, means that you need to prove that there is uniqueness. So there are two difficulties. You don't have uniqueness, and you don't have FKG. Okay. So these two things we need to, uh, to deal with. So lemma, the probability that there exists two uh, distinct infinite clusters equals 0. And before deducing that, I mean, before, before doing that, let's uh, see how you, it implies that there is no infinite cluster. So first thing here, so the problem is we don't have FKG. We cannot separate zero equal to infinity, x equal to infinity, and all. So what we are going to do is we are going to look at, um, at an average property. So we are going to say, or well, how we uh, do it? What is the best thing I could do? OK, so probability that 0 is connected to infinity. I'm going to take the expected number. Let's look at the expected number of points, so the sum of x in a box lambda n of indicators and x is connected to infinity. OK? So this, by definition, is equal to lambda n times the probability that 0 is connected to infinity. This is just by invariance under translations. But now, by Cauchy-Schwarz, 
This is smaller than the square root of the sum of the x and y in lambda n of the probability that x connected to infinity and y connected to infinity. Everything uh, times 1 over lambda n. Uh, okay, this is Cauchy Schwartz. Uh, what am I saying? No, there is no that. Okay, so expectation of n is smaller than expectation of n squared, and expectation of n squared is just this quantity. Now, here we are going to say, okay, this is this is smaller we call than the sum of x and y of the probability that x is connected to y. And this is by uniqueness. If um, both guys are connected to infinity, then they are connected together. And now here, we bound by the, by, so by this spin-spin correlation, sigma x, sigma y, to the long, um, to the beta. Since we assume that the, I mean, I assume the infimum meant the, the limit. Maybe I wrote infimum or limit in the condition of the theorem. It was limit. It's, it's equivalent, but it was limit. Sorry. So because we, this, one, this thing is going to become a little law of lambda n squared because of the assumption. This is the assumption. So here there is something a little bit, uh, I mean, something to, to be remembered is that the two-point function indeed implies the absence of infinite cluster without the FKG inequality. So you don't need, uh, as long as you have uniqueness, which you also need if you want to do the thing with the FKG inequality. So this is little of lambda n, so uh, as n tends to infinity, we deduce <laughs> this thing equals it. Very good. I mean, what is it good for? This is not what we are looking for, right? It's not our question. So the question now is, how do we, I mean, deduce that this thing implies our theorem? And then we will do the lemma, but I want to finish by the lemma. This thing is equal to what? Well, let's use, let's use, um, I mean, the switching lemma again in this case. Okay? So, so using, using the switching lemma, Uh, actually, actually, maybe no. Let, let me prove the le let me prove the lemma first because, in fact, that's the first time I present it with that much detail. So, I mean, there is something non-trivial in uh, in what we are going to do next. So maybe let's do it afterwards. Okay. So proof of the lemma. So we want to prove that there is no not infinitely many clusters. In fact, there will be finitely many will be sufficient, but not infinitely. So what is the argument that allows us to do that? That's the burton keen argument. Okay. The problem with the Burton-Kin argument, so you need ergodicity, you need invariance under translation, but you also need the insertion tolerance. Here you do not have insertion tolerance. You cannot dilate an edge in a random current 
The reason being that you may violate the fight that, I mean, the source constraint. But what you can observe is that you can always open an edge. So, observation is that if I take omega in 0, 1 to the edges of Zd, then the probability beta that omega um, of, uh, okay, the probability of edges of a finite graph G. The point is that we have omega E for every E in the edges in G. So. And omega F equal one for an edge F not in G, this thing is always larger or equal to a certain constant C times the probability of omega E for every E in G. So I can fix whatever I want in the graph G. I can always, for an edge which is not in this graph, I can always open the edge with finite cost. How do you prove that? Well, and this is not true for, uh, in, in, in the other context. I mean, if you take omega f equals zero. So how do you prove that? Well, let's look at the set A, which is a set of, of currents n1, n2, such that n1 plus n2 e is equal to omega e for every edge in your graph G. And let's look at B, which is the same thing, except that you also have omega f equal 1. So do I have a mapping between A and B? I have a mapping between A and B which, which consists in the following. What I can do, I can set n1 to stay n1, so n1 tilde, n2 tilde, n1 of e, if e is different from f, I mean, for every e n2 of e for every edge e not equal to f. And at the edge f, I'm going to define, so n2, t the, this is in bad notation, so it's going to be n1 of e, n2 of e for every edge e not equal to f. And for the other one, I'm going to define n1 of e, and I'm going to put here either n2 of e if n2 of e is not equal to 0, and 2 if it's equal to 0. So all the pairs of currents in A for which n2 is of f is 0, I just turn this to 2. So this map, check that phi, I mean, the weight of uh, phi of n1 uh, n2, if you want the probability of phi of n1 and two, well, you can check this is always larger or equal. I mean, the only difference is here. Sometimes I had weight one because for, for the edge f, the edge f was contributing weight one to the, 
to the second current, now it contributes weight beta squared over 2. Okay? Because that's the cost of putting it to weight n squared over 2. Uh, maybe, the, well, okay, so this thing is going to be larger or equal to beta squared over 2, the probability of n1 and 2. So what you would like to say is that if you sum on everybody, you are going to get uh, you are going to get um, that the probability of a is larger than the I mean the probability of b is larger than beta square over two probability of a. The only thing that you need to be careful about is that this is not a one-to-one -one map, right? For instance, if you take a current in b. I mean, a pair of currents in B, such that exactly N2 of F, N2 tilde of F is 2, then you don't know whether it comes from itself or it comes from the current with zero uh, sources, uh, with uh, N2 of F equals 0. But you have only two pre-images possible. OK? So when you sum over everybody, So if I look at probability, so I'm going to look at probability of A, but I'm going to look at twice this probability, then this is going to be smaller than the sum over uh, N1, N2, or, or if you prefer, it's going to be smaller than, yeah, the sum over N1, twice the sum over N1, N2 in A of the probability of phi of n1, n2. But now this, uh, did I do something wrong here? Probability of a, it was maybe a half, sorry. It's a half that I want. A half. So here, what I'm going to say is now this is smaller or equal because I put the half and that I have most two pre-images for every guy in the image. It's going to be smaller than this. Because I count guys at least twice, at most twice. But this, because obviously phi is going from A to B, this is smaller or equal to uh, P beta of B. OK? So now you did it for, more, for one edge, but you can do it for more than an edge. It's clear that you can do it for a whole box, for instance. You can switch everybody in a box. You are going to pay beta squared over 4 for every edge in your box. So this, as a consequence, basically what you are saying is that um, whatever the event A outside lambda n, and whatever uh, then the probability of A intersected with omega e equal 1 for every edge e in lambda n, this is larger or equal to probability of a times beta squared over 4 to the number of edges in lambda n. Hmm? Uh, which, yeah. And now here it's one half. OK? OK. So now let's try to run Burton Keynes' argument. So when we run it, first thing is we need to exclude the fact that we have finitely many number of clusters. So we know that the probability of having a certain number of clusters is 0 or 1. But the thing is, we can do exactly the same in, I mean, so from, uh, assume, I think it was E larger or equal to 1, the event that we were, uh, larger or equal to 2, the event that, uh, or, or E smaller than infinity. We had this event, which was there is finitely many edges. And our goal is, was to prove that this thing 
is larger than a certain constant times this thing. Right? This was the first part of the burton keen argument. If we have finitely many edges, then with positive quality, we have one at most. Because this biergodicity was implying that this thing, if this thing was one, then this thing had to be one. Okay? But this was implying, uh, wh how did we do that? We were ju we just taking a box large enough that with positive probability, we intersect all the clusters. And then we were doing what? We were turning everybody to open to get that there is a unique cluster. So this we can still do. So the argument, I mean, turning edges in the box to open can still be done. So that goes to implies implies this. So now the question is to remove infinitely many clusters. And there we have a problem because the notion of trifurcation, so we needed to prove that there is a trifurcation with positive probability. But the notion of trifurcation, we needed to close edges as well to do that. And this we cannot do anymore. So what we are going to do, we are going to speak of coarse trifurcations. So now, consider n large enough such that we have uh, three infinite clusters intersecting lambda n with, po with probability larger than constant times the probability of E infinity. So constant times the probability of having infinitely clusters. So we can always do that. And now we are going to say a coarse Trifurcation is simply a box lambda n satisfying everybody is open in the box. Every edge in lambda n satisfies omega e equal to 1. And um, there exists three disjoint infinite clusters in omega minus, I mean, in omega restricted to zd minus lambda n. So if I ignore in my head lambda n, I have three infinite clusters touching lambda n. So I have a box like that. All the edges are open here. And I have three division clusters touching the box. So by definition, these three clusters, they are in fact connected if I use the edges in the box. But if I ignore completely the edges in the box, I have three division clusters. And the probability here, plus this, this uh, insertion tolerance, allows me to say, then, the probability of lambda n being a coarse trifurcation is larger than constant beta square over 4 to the number of edges in lambda n times uh, probability of e infinity. So there, now I'm only using opening the edges. So the question now is what? 
Is, is it true that the coarse trifurcation satisfies the same property as the trifurcations? Uh, is it your alarm clock or your... Oh my god. I'm really sorry, Aran. Uh, can I take, uh, I mean, maybe we wait for the next snooze or something like that? Okay. Uh, <laughs> Okay, good. No problem at all. No problem. Okay. When you have this hair, you can do whatever you want. It's, uh, that's, uh, <laughs> okay, this is registered, I mean recorded. Uh, okay, um, for your 60th birthday conference, we will uh, mention this. Okay, so we are there, and we want to see if we have the same, uh, same um, property that these trifurcations, they have this structure of forest. That the, I mean, the coarse refurcation has the structure of forest. So let's do it step by step. Let's look at the first refurcation, I mean, coarse refurcation we have. Okay? There are three clusters at least connected to the boundary, maybe even let's say four for the first one. And now I ignore this guy, I turn it off in my head. I have three clusters and I just look for the next trifurcation. So where can the next trifurcation be? First, the next trifurcation, cost trifurcation, could simply be in another uh, cluster, not in these clusters. And then you would have three guys like that. Maybe it is in one of these guys. So maybe it's here. But the important thing is that then there must be a third cluster going out of this box when I ignore it, when I say, okay, this box in my head is closed. And where can this guy go? This guy has to go there. He cannot do anything else. Because notice that if he goes like that, because these edges, they are actually open. They are not in my head, I'm turning them, uh, in, in my procedure, I'm turning them uh, closed, but they are open. So this path would uh, invalidate the, the property of, uh, of being. Uh... So what could happen is that it does like that. Right? This may be doable, but then you still have a new edge there. Okay? And it cannot do like that. Let's see why. So it cannot do like that. Why cannot it do like that? I'm always confused when I do this argument. It's, uh, but it works. Several people more uh, attentive than me always uh, check these things. Um, Ah, yes, simply because these two clusters will... Ah, actually, it couldn't do, sorry, it couldn't do even that, sorry. Because then these two clusters were the same, sorry. So they couldn't even do that, yeah. When I came up with this thing, I was really uh, confused whether it would work or not. I had to check 10 times, but it seems to work. Okay, so you, every single time you add a, a coarse trifurcation, you add a vertex on the boundary. At least one on the boundary. And so we are exactly in the same structure as before, that the number of trifurcations, so the number, the expectation on the number of course trifurcations is smaller or equal to the size of the boundary. So here I'm just, let's be careful, when I mean course trifurcations, I mean here, in order to do this argument, I'm really looking at the coarse trifurcation, which is disjoint from the first one, right? Because if I have a coarse trifurcation here, then my argument is not working anymore. So here, what I'm going to look is the coarse trifurcations. They are going to be coarse trifurcation on a box, lambda n, but I'm going to look at uh, n times zd. I mean, centered. So maybe I should add centered, I mean, x belongs to n or even 2n times z. Okay? So I get that. 
and this thing, well, it's what? It's lambda n divided by uh, 2n to the d, because I'm only looking at fewer boxes, times the probability of being a coarse refurcation. So when n tends to infinity, we get that the probability of being cost refurcation is 0. But this is larger or equal to c times the probability of infinity. So it also implies this thing. OK, so the, the story here is the burton keen argument works very well if you only have insertion terminals. You don't, know, you don't need finite energy. You, can, you don't care about closing edges. You can just open them. And notice that this is really, I mean, this works for any measure satisfying uh, ergodicity, finite energy, uh, ergodicity, insertion tolerance, and, um, and uh, invariance under translations. OK. So this, uh, let's make a break and start again in, uh, in 15 minutes. Just finish, we are going to finish the proof. And I'm not sure I'm going to have time. I don't really want to rush. But maybe I'm going to tell you a little bit about just uh, triviality for uh, in dimension four. OK, so let's conclude the proof. So the idea is the following. So we know we don't have an infinite cluster. And we are going to use this to uh, control the following quantity. Look at sigma x sigma y plus minus sigma x sigma y with free boundary conditions. Let's look at this difference. Okay. And my goal is to prove that this is equal to 0. The difference is equal to 0. So of course, you always have this, right? And this, the plus state is always larger than the free state. You see it, for instance, from the random cluster model. The probability that x is connected to y for y boundary condition is larger than for free. But my, I'm interested in the other inequality. So this is what? This is z xy in g union delta times z mt in g minus z xy in g, z, or let's say z mt in g union delta times z xy in g. And this is divided by z mt g union delta z mt g. Right? So that's the ratio. So what, I mean, this now you start to be used to that. What do you want to do? You do the switching lemma. So you exchange, say, so once again here we have the problem of G and, I mean, not having the same graphs. But as I said, when you don't have the same graph, you can still do the switching. You can still do the switching from the smaller graph to the bigger one. So this one, you can do the switching. So it's going to be z x y empty set in g and in delta g. Here it's 1. And here, what you are going to get is this quantity, but with the indicator when x is connected to y in g. So this is what? This is just indicator that x is not connected to y in g. So what does it mean that x is not connected to y? We have sources at x and y. But our graph here is g union delta. So what it means for, uh, in the picture here is that you have x, you have y, and they are both connected to delta. And except that, in the graph, there is no connection between the two. So as uh, g tends to zd, what do I get? I get that this thing converges to the probability at beta 
that x and y are connected to infinity. Uh, I mean, okay, I should be a little bit careful. So this seems to converge to the probability that x and y are connected to infinity, but not together. Okay? The only thing is that I have sources at x and y. So it's not, it's not the sourceless current that I was working with. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just say, okay, it's not, I mean, there are sources. So let's just add a path. I choose a path, okay, let's say gamma. So choose gamma of x, y, a path between x and y. We fix this path. And let's open the edges and put an odd current there. If I do that, the current that I get is going to be a sourceless current now. X and Y will be connected together in this case, that's true, but it will be a sourceless current. Exactly like what we did for the finite energy property, you can prove that this operation of adding this odd thing like that, this path, is going to just be costing you basically something like beta to the length of your path a certain constant depending on x and y, but just a constant. So that means that this thing is smaller or equal to a certain constant depending on x and y times, so this is by adding uh, odd current on gamma xy times the probability now, now it's really a sourceless there and a sourceless here. So it's a probability, well, now x and y are connected, but the important thing that I'm going to keep in mind is that x is still connected to infinity. Because it was already before, so I add guys. So here I'm going to put x connected to infinity. But this by definition is zero. Okay, so it's a very strange fact, but you have a property on sourceless currents, uh, on currents with sources. You add your thing, you get, you get now a sourceless current, and the event that you get is still of probability zero. That's, and that's the end of the proof basically, because now notice that now. The FKG inequality implies, well, sigma x, sigma y plus is definitely larger than sigma 0 plus squared. Okay. Thus, we have 0, which is sigma x, sigma y plus beta minus sigma x sigma y free beta, which is larger than the magnetization squared minus sigma x sigma y free beta. But this we said tends to 0 as x minus 1 tends to infinity. And that's the end of the problem. So here I didn't prove that the states are the same, I just proved that the magnetization is zero. You can easily check that if the magnetization is zero, the states are the same. For instance, why? Because the magnetization is zero means for the wired boundary condition, the random cluster with wired boundary conditions, you do not have an infinite cluster. And somehow explore from, so explore from the outside until you see the first circuit Free circuit, I mean circuit of closed edges, I mean not circuit but hypersurface of closed edges blocking zero for infinity. Inside this hypersurface, in, in the interior, the random cluster measure is bounded by the random cluster measure with free boundary condition on that, which is smaller than the random cluster model with free boundary condition in the bulk. So what you just prove is that the wired boundary condition is dominated by the free in this case, so they must be equal. 
That's a way of seeing it. Well, that's the end of this proof. So here, I mean, the only thing I omitted is that this, the existence of this CXY, but this is really the same proof as a, it's a, you are going to define a map phi and, and it works the same. Okay, let me just finish with uh, the icing on the cake somehow. Ah, uh, one remark. One, one remark before the icing. Um, where do we use that sigma x, sigma y free tends to zero? Here we don't really use it, in fact. Uh, in this case, when you have that this is equal to this, you can, in fact, conclude. Here it's just it's convenient because I have the, the, um, the hypothesis. I can easily convince you that the magnetization square is zero. But in fact, this quantity implies that the plus and the free state are the same. This, this is not where we use it. The only place where we use that there is, uh, that the spin-spin correlation is zero is, I mean, it's tending to zero, is to prove that um, is to prove this property. Um, no, it's to prove that there is no infinite cluster, sorry. Notice that that's not what we are using. We are using this property somehow, that there is no infinite pass somehow. Where, like if, if imagine this occurs with positive probability. That means what? That means that your infinite clusters, when they exist, they look like sausages. They look like, I mean, sequences of sausages like that. And so on. Right? They cannot branch. Oh, and they can branch, sorry. They can also branch like that. But they cannot have long cycles. That's what this thing is telling you. There is a person. Imagine X and Y are neighbors. Actually, it's sufficient to look at X and Y neighbors. This argument, if you have for X and Y neighbors, is sufficient. Once again, here I wanted to tell you something more direct, but X and Y neighbor is sufficient. So it's just meaning if you can prove that the probability of having an edge which is somehow pivotal in the sense that you have this. You have an infinite cluster on the left, infinite cluster on the right. They do not touch each other, and this edge is open. If you could prove that, that this thing doesn't occur, then you will have the, you will have the theorem without assumption. You have that the free state and the plus state are the same. So it's very likely, I mean, you really believe that you should be able to prove that for a large class of models, of ESIG models. So if you want to get rid somehow of, of all this, uh, these troubles and you want to take the plus boundary condition to be equal to the free one always, which is what we expect, um, I mean, the free state should be the average of the plus and minus state, and this should always be true, basically, even when you have a first order first condition. If you would like to prove that, you should prove that these random currents, they do not have this sausage structure, which we know how to prove for percolation, for instance, but we don't know how to prove for random current. The FKG inequality, for instance, you can think about it, allows you to get rid of that, of this thing. So that's the first remark. And uh, now the last theorem of the, the class, the theorem, uh, let d larger or equal to 5, then u4 of 0, x, y, and z divided by sigma 0, sigma x, sigma y, sigma z is tending to 0 as we take here. Let's say we take 0, x, y, and z just in such a way that they are all at distance order n of each other. So somehow take the box of size n, take four points in a generic con uh, si I mean, uh, situation, generic position, meaning that there are not two that are too close to each other, 
look at the truncated four-point function divided by the, just the spin spin. I mean, this is the order of each one of the terms, basically. So you have divided by one of this order. Does it converge to zero or not? And the answer is that in dimension five and more, it does. So this is, this is one way of writing. It's not exactly how people write what we call the triviality of the field because it's a rather, it's an average quantity and so on that people look at, but it's the same ingredients that work, I mean, that are used to prove uh, triviality and to prove this statement. Basically, this is triviality. Let's, let's simplify a little bit. Like, uh, it's a similar statement that, that, that yields triviality. So it really means, in, in just a second, it really means in five dimension and more, basically if you want to compute the four point function of four points that are far away from each other, it's like the big product. It's like the product of the pairings. I mean, spin, spin for pairings. This is wrong in dimension three. It's wrong in dimension two. And in dimension four, it's still true, but nobody knows how to prove it. Okay, and let me just sketch to you the proof. So, Instead of zero, actually instead of x, y, uh, zero, x, y, z, let's, let me call them one, two, three, four, the points. And u4, we saw that u4 of one, two, three, four was equal to minus two times one, two, uh, one, three, two, four. And then we have the probability with sources at 1, 3, and 2, 4 of getting um, 1 connected, I mean, to 2, 3, and 4. Everybody connected together. You remember that's what we derived last time, and we, I mean, yeah, maybe last time or the time before. So what this statement there, I mean, maybe it's, uh, yeah, sigma, okay, sigma 0, sigma x. I mean, this statement is just saying this quantity tends to zero, okay? When one, two, three, four are far away from each other. So this, is uh, exactly saying the cluster, well, okay, this is saying, yeah, the cluster, for n1 plus n2 of 1 intersect the clusters for n1 plus n2 of, three, uh, of 2. That's the same thing. 1 is already connected to 3, 2 is already connected to 4, so they are all connected together if and only if the 1 is connected to 2. So here there is a manipulation which is based on the switching lemma and which is not very transparent, so let's not really bother about it, which says, okay, this quantity is of the same order or actually is smaller or equal to the following quantity. I'm going to keep this, but I'm going to add a new current N3, and I can still look at the same Quantity. This is an equality. I'm just adding uh, not another current, but I'm ignoring completely what it does. But here, the trick is that, in fact, it's possible to replace by N3. So it's the intersection of these two currents with the third one. And it's going to be, it's going to be basically, it's not quite true, but it's going to be a switching lemma involving the second and third current. But it's, it's not exactly that. It's uh, something a little bit more tedious. But it is a switching lemma type argument. This cannot be very transparent. I mean, to me, it's not so transparent why it's, uh, it works, but it does. But then, you know, why stopping in such a good uh, direction? Let's just add an additional current. Uh, so this is that this thing is not equal to the, to the empty set. So this was not clear that if you change these two currents into a third one, you get the, you still get in this thing. Really think these guys 
I mean, I mean, if you explore the, the sum of the two currents from one and you do not reach three, uh, two, sorry, then it's going to be if if you sample a current which is random from n, I mean, independent from uh, from uh, n two, from from two, you still have a chance to intersect. So somehow it's uh, it's why it's it's, uh, it's it's true, but. Really, the proof is not very illuminating, so I'm, I'm going to, to me, I'm sure that to, to Michael it is, but you know, to me it's not. So what I can add is, OK, here I can just add N4. You know, let's just add an additional current. All of this seems terrible, right? I mean, you are adding, adding, and adding. But really think, in dimension 4, anyway, these currents they are very sparse, very thin. So adding currents is not costing you too much. OK, so let's keep you know, doing horrible things to, uh, to us. Let's, let's say, OK, this is even smaller than the expected number of points in the intersection. So let's sum over y. Probability 1, 3, 2, 4, empty set, empty set. I'm realizing that maybe I'm making a mistake in the sources. Uh -huh. OK, we are going to see. Of y belong to C1, uh, to Cn1 plus n2, and y belong to of 1, of cluster of 2, of n3 plus n4. Yeah, I'm making a mistake, sorry, here when I change, I mean, when I change to n3, I'm putting empty and 2, 4. You, you are already doing a, sw uh, a switching lemma, so, so you need to switch uh, the sources, sorry. Like that. And here it's independent. But this event and this event, they are independent now that I have these sources. So if you look at the computation, you are going to get the sum of a y of the probability with one, three, and empty set of y is connected to uh, one uh, set to one times the probability for two four empty sets of y connected to two. Okay, that's equivalent. And this one you can really do. This maybe I even did it. No, I don't remember if I did it as an application of the random. Yeah, I did it when I, uh, I wanted to prove Simon's inequality. I use a switching lemma to say this quantity is equal to what? Is equal to sigma 1, sigma y, sigma y, sigma 3, divided by sigma 1, sigma 3. That's, I mean, uh, we, we did exactly that in, the, in Simon's inequality. And the other one is sigma 2, sigma y, sigma y, sigma 4, over sigma 2, sigma 4. OK? Well, sigma 1, and then now, what you can use is you can use the infrared bound, basically. And so let's just, I mean, I, I, as I said, I, I'm not proving completely here. I have a first step that I'm Using the second step that I'm using is that here, let's, let's assume. Ah, I totally no, let's not assume anything. So this is 1 over sigma 1, sigma 3, sigma 2, sigma 4. So this is perfect because it's exactly uh, counterbalancing. Uh, oh, well, OK. Sum over y of sigma 1, sigma y, sigma y, sigma 3 sigma 2, sigma y, and sigma y, sigma 4. So now this quantity, how are we going to bound it? We are going to bound it by the infrared bound. So this is smaller or equal to the sum of a y of y minus 1 to the d minus, I mean, to the 2 minus d, y minus 3 to the 2 minus d, y minus 4, I mean, mi minus 2 minus 3 to the 2 minus d, and y minus 4 to the 2 minus d. OK? So I realize I'm, I'm, 
uh, something not great in, uh, in, the, in this part of the presentation, is that I'm not going to prove exactly the proof I wanted, uh, the, the thing I wanted to do. Let's assume for a moment that, in fact, everybody is of the order of, uh, so let's assume that sigma x, sigma y is of the order of x minus 1 to the x minus y to the 2 minus d. Really of the order. So these two guys, they are of order what? These two guys, they are of order 1 over n to the d minus 2 squared. I have two guys like that. And here, if you do this big sum, you are going to get what? Basically, the generic point y which matter. Let's, let's ignore when y is close to one of the points because there is no difficulty in, in summing these things. So there are roughly n to the d points y. And each one, these guys, are going to contribute for 1 over n to the d minus 2 to the 4. And here, sorry, it was because it's a ratio, it's n to the 2 d minus 2. OK? This is just, I mean, here this sum is of this order. You can just check easily. But now, here, when I put everybody together, what do I get? I get n to the 4 minus d. Normally, I should get that. Do I get that? So the d, I get 1d, which is at the bottom, and then I get 4. And here it's, yeah, I get that. Good. So this thing is tending to 0 as n tends to infinity. And that's the end. The problem is that here, I assume that these guys were not very small which is not completely obvious. So either you change the statement of the theorem and just say, instead of proving uh, all of this, I just prove that u4 is smaller than n to the 4 minus, uh, I mean, it's smaller than what it should be, basically. I mean, you can prove that uh, u4 is smaller than that, right? Because this is exactly canceling with this. So this, this could be a weaker version of, of uh, triviality. And anyway, what happens is that, in fact, you can prove this inequality there. Yes? But actually, you need a weaker statement right there, right? So say if it was less than 3 halves minus d, it's still OK. It will still be rocky. Yes. Is it easier to no. prove it? No. No, it's not easier. But it's not very difficult to prove the other inequality. It's, uh, this is not uh, not the end of the world. Yes. It's for all data, or you are looking at criticality? So here, I mean, because here you are doing it for data. for all data. So exponential sigma one, sigma three, you should have an exponential decay. Yes. In subcritical, you mean? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So here, I mean, yeah. What, what I meant is at, I mean. In order to get that, I mean, it's really at beta c, of course. Huh? That's, I, don't, I do not claim that this is true uh, for beta small. It's not true. But the computation up to this stage is independent of beta, uh, independent of beta. So yeah, so so that, I mean, the only thing is you should you should prove the other inequality, and this this you can do with all this in, uh, with all this inequality. So basically. The important thing is that here, what you recognize is if you would be summing on 1, 3, 2, and I mean, let's say you fix 1 and it's three, you sum on 2, 3, and 4, what is going to be this quantity is going to be the, the susceptibility to the power 4. So if you sum this guy, you fix 1 and you sum on 2, 3, 4, you get the susceptibility to the power 4. And this is the start of the story somehow to really prove the real statement on, uh, I mean, the actual statement on, uh, on uh, triviality is not the one I mentioned. It's something on the big sum, on the sum of everybody. And there, you can just, you only need the, the upper bound, 
the less or equal. Once you have that, in fact, you can derive the, uh, the other bound, the larger or equal. Okay? Okay, it's not such a good uh, end for the class, but somehow I, I just wanted to illustrate here the fact that you, you see the dimension 5 occurring through this quantity. Okay? And this is the end, and uh, so this was actually the original uh, article. I mean, they, he, he proved things like that. He proved much more, but it's a little bit more complicated, so I, I really, I mean, I don't really want to bother you too much with, uh, with this. And he basically proves everything you want to prove in dimension 5 and more. If you want a very interesting problem is to try to understand why this thing is tending to zero in dimension four. This is really something that we don't know how to do and, and which is very interesting. Here it's very likely that even this thing, this bound is not so good. I'm not sure that you want to do that. Like uh, it's unclear whether it's for free. This one is even more unclear that you, uh, I mean that it's good to, to do this inequalities. It's unclear what you get from something tending to zero to something which doesn't tend to zero anymore. Because if you notice in dimension four, this quantity, when you, you sum over y, I mean, if you assume that you, have of, you are of the order of this, this quantity doesn't go to zero. It really doesn't. Actually, it, it, uh, it goes logarithmically. Uh, it grows logarithmically. What is the correction? Uh, is it positive or very positive? Positive. So in principle, we have something more in the, in the prefactor, right? Mm -hmm. Which helps us. There is something more in the prefactor. Here? No, what is going to help you is that, you see, if you intersect the guy, in fact, conditionally on intersecting at a point, uh, I mean, Conditionally, on a point being on the intersection of the two, at every scale, you are going to intersect, in fact. So, so you are going to have logarithmic, not every scale, but every polynomial, like uh, n, to, n to the 1 plus epsilon, you are going to intersect. But every single time you intersect, you <laughs> intersect several times. So in fact, the expected number of intersections conditionally on intersecting is log. That's going to be um, the problem. OK, well, thank you very much. So no class next week, and uh, you are on vacation, so enjoy. And we meet again in Les Diableraies.